Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Hi there, and welcome to the latest in a special series of shows that we're publishing all week here on the Art of Procurement. So if you haven't heard already, we've got five different shows that are being published with procurement thought leaders all through this week. They're going live Monday through Friday. Today is the Thursday show, so uh, you've already missed three different episodes. Um, I'd encourage you to go check them out if you haven't heard them already at artofprocurement.com slash bigidea2016. Well, these interviews are part of what we're calling the Big Idea Week. And it's um, a part of Procurious's Big Idea Summit. It's in conjunction with Procurious. Each of the guests is a keynote speaker or a panelist at the upcoming summit, which is on April the 21st. My guest today is Chris Brown. Chris is the Chief Procurement Officer of the World Bank. I think the scope of Chris's responsibility is pretty staggering. It spans uh, $44 billion in active projects across 173 different countries. Chris and his team at the World Bank, they're responsible for implementing and executing procurement best practices to projects in some of the most hostile or poverty-stricken locations anywhere on the planet. In addition to this, Chris has led the World Bank on a multi-year transformation program, and it's one that I think that has complexity, challenges, conflicting stakeholder interests, and also the number of different constituents that think that you'd be hard-pressed to really rival in any organization and certainly any other procurement transformation program. So there's a lot to be learned in this show, and a lot to be learned, I think, for both public and private sector organizations, specifically in terms of some of the critical success factors needed to execute a procurement transformation initiative like the World Bank has embarked on. And I have to say that I've really enjoyed this conversation with Chris. It's really opening my eyes to the world of public procurement. It's an area of our profession that I haven't really been involved in in the past. And it's interesting to me how there's really so many similarities between the challenges of the public sector and the challenges of the private sector. Okay, well, before we go into the show, if you enjoy the content that we share here on the Art of Procurement and the podcasts that we publish... I wanted to let you know that you can sign up to receive an email every time that a new show is published. To do that, just head on over to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe, leave your email address, or just look for the sign-up bar on the top of the Art of Procurement homepage. Either way, leave your email address and um, I'll send you an email every time a show goes live. I've also got a couple of reports that have uh, been very successful and, and have got some really great feedback um, that I'll share with you as a thank you for, um, for trusting me with your email address. All right, well, with all that being said, let's go straight into the discussion with Chris. Hi there, and I'm delighted to welcome Chris Brown, the Chief Procurement Officer of the World Bank, to today's Art of Procurement show. So, Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, I shared some of your background with listeners as part of my introduction to the show, but um, I'm interested if you could just give the um, the two-minute version. I know you've got such a varied um, career, both in terms of roles and in terms of geography. So I wonder if you could just share that with listeners. Okay. Uh, I joined procurement uh, at the age of 16 mm-hmm. uh, with British Coal. Uh did a trainee program with them. I found that I liked uh, procurement and uh, specialised in that. Uh, they were very good and sponsored me to do my business studies degree mm-hmm. and my uh, SIPs exams. Uh, from there, I did some time with local government, uh, then went to work for the uh, National Rivers Authority, which is where I then started specializing in construction projects, okay. particularly flood defense, water treatment uh, type procurements. Uh, from there, I went to work for the Environment Agency, again, working on uh, construction uh, projects primarily, but also there I was able to begin leading on sustainable procurement, mm-hmm. which was a new topic at the time. Uh, from that, meaning that I was an early person working in sustainable procurement, we then started getting lots of requests to talk at conferences because it suddenly became a trendy thing <laughs> right. uh, for people to work on. And before I knew where I was, so I was supporting a United Nations task force. Um, co-authoring the UK Sustainable Procurement Strategy, 
uh, and got a very high profile around that subject. From that, I um, emigrated to New Zealand, um, then started working initially on their sustainable procurement program, but that quickly to then changed into reforming and um, developing the whole public procurement system within right. New Zealand. And from there, I was asked to come and work at the World Bank uh, to lead the procurement transformation program here. Well, that's pretty varied um, background. And I actually had a question on sustainable procurement you mentioned there. How have you seen the importance of sustainability and procurement evolve over the last few years? Is it something that is still one of those things that people want to invest in, but they aren't sure how? Or, or do you see both public and private sector starting to take it seriously? Uh, I think what we see different things in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think particularly in Europe, we we see this as something that's now embedded and part of you know doing a good procurement job. It's I don't think it's particularly seen as something that's special or odd. Right. It's just part of doing a good procurement risk management job. Mm -hmm. Of course, depending on where you work, there'll be different focuses on that. Um, but it's generally a big issue that most people working in procurement in Europe will have to deal with. As we move into other parts of the world, um, they will see it as something odd and strange. Um, and uh, they're probably at the point where they're still having to prove why this matters and right. why they need to take it into account. Of course, the big issue uh, that's affected a lot of this is, of course, with economic uh, downturns and then pressures that organizations have had on cost. But I think the, the organizations that really understand what it means recognize that, you know, it's just part of doing business now mm -hmm. and uh, it's something they have to do to maintain market share and manage supply chain risks. And something you mentioned there was about doing the differences of doing business in various different parts of the world. And so I was interested yep. in, um, from a cultural perspective, I know you've got a lot of experience both in terms of where you've worked, but also the scope of your current spend. How does yep. culture impact what you're able to do and, and the way that procurement is either seen or executed around the world? <laughs> um, well, probably the biggest single issue we, we face working at the World Bank, and I, I think it probably says something about our procurement profession is uh, the biggest issue we have to manage is fraud and corruption. Yeah. Um, and um, unfortunately, that's the disease that affects procurement around the world. Again, you know, when we work in certain parts of the developed world, it's not really on the agenda because it's something that's you know viewed as being dealt with. Mm -hmm. And the transparency, the transparency international ratings give you a steer on how well that's managed or not. But when we move to other parts of the world, it becomes the number one issue that procurers have to face uh, and governments have to manage. And therefore, when you have the lens of managing fraud and corruption, that really changes your approach to how you run and manage a procurement process and all the safeguards that you need mm -hmm. to put in place to try and stop uh, bribery and corruption happening. And the priorities of your team change, I guess, in each region of the world. Yeah, exactly. And um, and also the way you engage with business right. changes and uh, the models you have to – some of the things that perhaps we take for granted, mm -hmm. you know, when we're working in the UK, um, you, you can't take for granted when you're working in other parts of the world. So, for example, negotiation can be a facilitator for bribery, uh, whereas, you know, working in Europe, we would consider that to be just good, normal commercial practice and – probably those risks wouldn't even enter into our minds. But uh, in other parts of the world, it becomes a very different way of looking at things. So I w wanted to touch on your current role as CPO of the World Bank and, and kind of an, an understanding for listeners, if you could just explain, what is the World Bank, essentially? What is the mandate of the World Bank? It's funny. When I, when I talk to procurement people who live in the developed world, they've generally not heard of the World Bank. Right. Uh, but when I talk to procurement people in the developing world, they've all heard of the World Bank. And it's not it's not surprising. Um, so the, the easiest way to think about the World Bank um, is we're like the uh, Treasury project delivery part of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we were formed at the same time. Um, we are a bank, but we're, we're not a bank in a traditional sense. Um, our role is to basically help development through uh, projects and change and uh, project delivery. Uh, the way we do that is we either give 
or we lend uh, at very low interest rates, sometimes nil, um, money to countries to deliver particular development projects. But what, what the World Bank does is it has all the technical support, the procurement rules, um, everything that kind of helps to make that project work and be effective. Our procurement portfolio is 44 billion US dollars. So that's billion with a B um, per year. Um, so, sorry, so the 44 billion is all the procurements that are happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the churn, uh, it's about 25 billion US per year. So that's big by anybody's imagination. Right. Yeah. Um, the sorts of projects we do are everything from building underground metro systems through to railways, roads, hospitals, schools, immunization programs, uh, power uh, transmission, power stations, water purification, etc. So mm -hmm. a lot of really big infrastructure projects. About 75% of everything we do is either a water project, an energy project, or a transport project. Interesting. So a big portfolio. We work in 173 different countries around the world, uh, including some of the world's poorest and most fragile. Um, so it's a complex portfolio uh, all over the world and um, some very innovative uh, types of procurements that we have to deliver. Yeah, and so do you have a team that is um, located in all those different locations? Or are you a central services team that basically goes out to the regions to deliver on those projects when they happen? 80% uh, of our staff are in country offices. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have um, 250 people uh, that work in procurement in the bank full time, uh, supplemented by another three to 400 um, a temporary kind of consultants, contractors that support procurement uh, activities. Um, our staff are actually based in about 75 different country offices. And then they provide support to other countries where, you know, there's not enough critical mass to have right. somebody there full time. Right. So, for example, our Sydney office um, supports our projects in Fiji, Samoa, uh, the Pacific Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea, etc. So what's the priorities of the team? I know you mentioned about ensuring some fair and proper bidding processes before. Is that the number one or is it really, does it come down to the traditional procurement metric of cost and managing cost? For the World Bank, you know, the number one priority is getting the development results on the ground. Yeah. Um, so, that, you know, that's making sure that when we build the power plant, you know, it, it's done to time, it's done to budget. Uh, as, as any as any organization uh, would would want to do, uh, but also making sure that it endures. so we we want a we want a situation that when the world world bank steps back from the project, you know because we're not there forever, mm -hmm. uh, that things are in place that the power station can run you know over its life, that maintenance is managed properly, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about development that endures over the long term. Not not just uh, short term fixes, right? So there was longevity in what you, the investment basically that the investment delivers what it's mo what it's supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fraud and corruption is you know I raised it because um, you know it came out of what are some of the challenges that we face, and I guess that's one of the more unusual things that perhaps we have to deal with, and uh, perhaps some of your listeners might be used to. Right. Um, but it's only one of the things we have to manage, and uh, you know one of the big changes we're bringing in is is driving much more business engagement, early dialogue. Again, things that we take for granted if we're working in the UK. But, you know, when you're working in um, you know, a country that's literally just coming out of civil war, uh, security situation's bad, uh, companies don't really want to go there, uh, you have to take quite a different approach to how you run that procurement. Right. Cost is certainly not the most important thing. It's risk and actually ensuring you're able to deliver on what the need is. Yeah, dare I say, you know, we look at it in terms of total cost. Right. So, so not yeah. just the basic, you know, not just the basic construction cost, but how much it costs overall, mm -hmm. including, you know, all of our inputs, the maintenance and uh, and everything else. Before we go into the topic of your upcoming presentation at the uh, Procurious Big Idea Summit, I had a couple of questions about the transformation journey that you've undertaken at the World Bank. Yep. And you mentioned it a little bit before. Um 
I was interested to know with the number of constituents that you have, which, you know, you talked about um, how broad the scope is. How do you even start to develop a reform program? Yeah, okay. If I say to you, I have no hair anymore. Uh, <laughs> you that'll, did when you started. Yeah, well, nearly. Um, okay. Um, to put it, I mean, let me give you the kind of numbers that are a little bit staggering. Mm-hmm. So uh, to develop this reform program, remembering we're an international organization, remembering we're funded by governments around the world who all have a say in what we do, um, when you're developing a procurement change program like this, um, the first thing you realize is procurement impacts nearly every project, and nearly every country has an opinion on it. You know, they're either, they're either countries that receive money from the bank and therefore are using the procurement process, and or their businesses are directly affected by it, or their businesses perhaps want to grow their market share, etc. So nearly everybody has an opinion on procurement. Um, so what that means is in developing this, uh, the way it worked, it's been a three-year program, probably too long. Uh, I mean, we'd have liked to do it quicker than that, but mm-hmm. um, I guess that shows life in a big international bureaucracy. Uh, so we start with an initial concept, you know, that we believe we need to modernize and change our procurement and why. Uh, the startling numbers are we did two rounds of global consultations uh, which were face-to-face discussions with 5,000 people uh, in 100 countries over two years. So that was two global rounds of dialogue. The first one was about uh, asking people what they like with our current way of working and what they don't like, and therefore what they think needs to change. Then from that, we do trend analysis, and we kind of bring it down to these are the common areas of concern uh, that people have, and also our own views on what we need to do to modernize. Mm-hmm. Uh, we then present proposals to our board, which is 25 people representing 173 countries. Uh, their job is to represent the interests of those countries at our board. And we have a consensus decision making model. So you have to kind of bring everybody with you. So that, that can be quite a challenge at times. Uh, What that then led to was another global round of consultations, which was then checking with people whether our proposals for dealing with the things that they told us made sense, whether they agreed. Uh, And then from that, we developed our final package of how we believe procurement in the bank needs to modernize. And the sorts of things, you know, that we were talking to people about were things like value for money decision making, uh, strategic engagement with businesses um, to, you know, tailor um, procurement approaches to particular sectors, Mm -hmm. uh, sustainable procurement, uh, how we manage integrity and fraud and corruption, how we actually develop the procurement profession globally, etc. So a whole range of things, some of which probably to your listeners won't sound very radical, um, but in this environment, and again, with the lens of you know some of the countries that we work with, then right. something like value for money decision making is a scary concept because you know they're used to lowest price. Lowest price is a binary decision; it either is or it isn't, and therefore it's very defendable. The moment you start bringing in quality and other factors, then uh, some people get very nervous. The auditors get nervous. And particularly when you're working in countries where there's high levels of corruption, um, you have to think about how you manage that kind of process, where, again, in the UK, we would probably take something like that for granted uh, and something we've, we've been doing for 20-odd years. Um, so a lot of this is bringing you know, current good practice procurement methods, I guess, into parts of the world where the risks and the operating environment have prevented them from working mm-hmm. in the past. And, and I do think that, um, you know, private enterprises and, and listeners to the show can learn a lot from a transformation program like this because some of the tenants that you go through, some of the key um, you know, enablers are the same, whether it's a, a smaller, you know, transformation program for a billion dollar revenue company versus the change that yeah. you have had. I mean, it may be on a different scale and it may be a different pace, but I think that um, yeah. some of the learnings are exactly the same and can be applied um, to to whatever the size of the transformation is. 
Yeah, I think uh, there's, I mean, it's clear, you know, I, I've been working on procurement transformation for kind of 10 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, and it's clear to me there's a common set of issues uh, that most procurement transformations have to deal with, streamlining, um, streamlining activities, uh, building capacity, uh, working out the areas of spend in the organization where you add the most value right. to getting in early in the project cycle development so you can influence things positively rather than trying to fix things at the end. Um, you know, getting procurement with the right profile in the organization so it has the ability to influence. I think all of those things are common, whether you're in an SME, right. uh, you know, a, a large private sector or, or anywhere in the public sector. So you're going to be participating in a session at the upcoming Procurious Big Idea Summit on April the 21st. And I know that the uh, the discussion is focused around looking at kind of leading edge or, or new procurement-led solutions that are more suited to this environment where um, you're in a much faster-paced environment than we were before. I was interested to understand as part of your transformation in the reform program at the World Bank, if you had implemented new delivery models or new technology that um, you think are helping the transformation that may not have applied in the past? Probably the um, biggest thing we're doing there is particularly when we're working in what we call fragile uh, conflict states. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's a list of those in the bank. It, it's countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Haiti, uh, Timor-Leste, um, etc. Um, is Basically, what we need to do is just get the procurement happening and moving quickly and get far faster uh, decision making. So what we're doing on those projects is we're actually placing uh, bank procurement staff uh, with into the project team mm -hmm. uh, and then placing them actually within the government office. So rather than, you know, procurement being somebody that somebody comes to you know, for help and assistance at key points is actually embedding people in throughout the project. So having, um, you know, dedicated project teams. And then what links to that is then how we empower those people uh, to act and to take decisions, uh, take risks if needed, uh, but that they can actually uh, take those decisions on the ground far faster rather than having to, you know, come and get separate approvals. So, um, you know, let me give you an example. So a, uh, a low-risk uh, construction project, we delegate out to our field office staff up to $250 million. Mm -hmm. uh, a high-risk construction, we delegate out up to $30 million. So part of this is creating the environment that people are empowered to act and to make decisions but they know they have access to support and help uh, when they need it uh, to actually help them to deliver, recognizing, you know, we work in some very difficult situations. So, so, so some of this is policy streamlining, practice streamlining, but, but, you know, that all sounds dreadfully public sector. What it's really about is empowering people to deliver on the ground, giving them the space, giving them the delegations, and they're wrapping around them a support framework that enables them to act uh, and deliver, uh, knowing they've got the protection and the support from, uh, from the team in the center. No, it, it means that they're not as reliant on decision makers at, at the core for some of those lower risk projects, and so they can move faster. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and then having um, you know, very strict targets and monitoring around how fast uh, those decisions are happening and uh, things are happening on the ground. And so do you have a formal risk assessment process at the beginning of each project, which then helps you book it, a project into that low-risk, high-risk state? No, we manage $44 billion with no risk assessment whatsoever. <laughs> it's a very comprehensive uh, risk process in the bank. Um, there's kind of layers, you know, there's, there's kind of 10 layers of the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. I mean, remembering these are, often multi-hundred million dollar projects. Uh, big, big focus is on operating context, then also the market context and the market's ability to respond. Yeah. You know, recognizing it's very different if we're, you know, doing a construction project in a small Pacific island to if we're doing a metro project in China, 
to if we're, let's say, getting the healthcare system up and running again in Afghanistan. So the market will respond differently to those different contexts. Um, and then, of course, addressing those risks through the right procurement approach and then empowering and delegating to the staff to deliver um, is the way we make things happen quickly. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that private sector can absolutely learn because my personal experience, I've worked in a number of different industries. I've worked in financial services where risk is important and I've worked in other sectors where it just isn't as considered. And when you look at yeah. how procurement can bring value, there's a lot of discussion around risk, but it's something I don't think that the private sector has yet got its arms around what that really means. What are the risk factors you should be addressing and how that then influences the process of the execution of a project, for example? Yeah, and one of the, one of the things we find is, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of procurement people are quite arrogant. Um, and, and what I kind of mean, you know, I don't mean it in a nasty way. I'm a, I'm a procurement person <laughs> right. myself. Um, um, but... Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, some of us assume that because we're throwing out a big multi-million dollar project that the private sector will come, you know, that the bidders, uh, in effect, will come scraping and bowing at our door uh, wanting to do this. And, of course, that's not the case. There's, there's, there's as much of a competition for talent um, in uh, in suppliers as there is amongst uh, a competition for talent to get the best procurers. Um, and, I, and what what I see is, you know, the clever procurement people understand how to package and sell uh, the project or the procurement to the private sector in order to get the best response. Um, and uh, that that doesn't just mean throwing around glib words like partnering and strategic alliances, but it, it really means, you know, project by project and perhaps how we group things together. Um, how we actually, you know, win that competition for talent. If they're remembering for us, you know, we're trying to encourage those companies to put their best and brightest on projects that are perhaps in parts of the world that they don't feel so comfortable working with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's probably can be the subject of an entire different conversation because there's so much, I think, in there around how do you make yourself attractive as a um, as a business partner. Because you're right, I think yeah. the larger the organization we are, the more um, the more we feel that we our name and our brand will um, compel people to engage with us and give us the best that they've got, however well we treat them or badly. Yeah, exactly. I have one last question before we wrap up, and that's one that I've been asking all guests during this series of Big Idea interviews. And that's, you know, if you think about what's one thing that a procurement professional can do, um, to really help increase the value to their stakeholder, what would you recommend them to do? What, what, in your experience, what's been the biggest win? Okay, so for me, uh, I'm just really understand what it is that the stakeholder wants. And if you possibly can, you give it to them. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in cooperating people into submission uh, wherever possible. Uh, I therefore pick my battles very carefully. Um, and uh, I think what you then start to show to people is the value that they can really get from professional procurement. You know, if we're a group of jobs worth rules followers uh, who just throw bureaucracy at people all of the time, then it's not surprising that people aren't very interested in procurement. Um, but, if we're, but if we're the kind of people who are engaging, uh, we're personable, uh, we, you know, work through collegially you know how to how to get the right result then guess what they want your help next time uh they talk to you early um and um you actually you know before you know where you are you're recruiting more staff you're building your procurement team uh and your profile in the organization grows um so you know for me the big th i i believe in what procurement does it can add tremendous value and help but unfortunately, sometimes we're not so good at the relationships. Um, and I think where you see those procurement people that, you know, really excel in organizations uh, are the ones that know, uh, you know, are really good at managing the internal relationships, but most importantly, actually deliver results and, uh, you know, and then their reputation and their department builds from there. Yeah, so provide what the business wants from you, not what what you think you should be delivering, just because of what your individual objectives are. Correct, and then you know showcase that and grow. 
Chris, I know that we're bumping up against time, so um, I will just like to say that uh, I'm going to put the links and notes from all the episodes of the Big Idea Week interviews at artofprocurement.com slash bigidea2016. I'm also going to link to the Big Idea Summit, and there you can find details on how to register as a digital delegate for the event, which is April 21st. So, Chris, uh, once again, just thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I've appreciated you carving out uh, some time in a very busy schedule to talk to me today. Okay, you're very welcome, and uh, I, I hope the podcast is of interest to people. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.